The following tales were told by Mr. George Geddes, 3 Grant Street, Einston. George was interviewed on 28th of April, 1988, and in, in the interview, George recalled his days at sea, his memories of the opening of the extended Clooney Harbour, and the loss of the sail fishing boat, the Loyal, with all hands. Well, I come from a fishing family on both sides. My grandfather, my mother's father, came down for the country because they were crofter fishermen for a start. Then after, after that they started going out in bigger boats. They started first in scuffies, and then they went in for bigger sailing boats, and then after that they started going to sea as steady fishermen. My mother's side came for the sloch, potesse, fit the card the rotten sloch. My father's side came for buckpool on the shores of buckpool. That's where the fishermen started there. Their forebears came in from the sea, came in from the sailing ships and settled on the shore, and they started fishing. Buckpool Herber was the first harbour and Bucky Herber was built later on. One basin which is now filled up for the cargo of timber. When I was at the school in 1918 or 17, Bucky Herber was opened. We was marched down from the school to see the opening. In my lifetime, my grandfather, both my grandfathers, owned sailboats. My grandfather in Portesi had the G.D. Gairn and the Dexterous, two sailboats. The Dexterous was a scuffy and the Genie Gairn was a sailboat, a Zulu. My grandfather in Buckpool had the Ellen Ann, also a Zulu. When I started first at the sea, I was just 14. We went to the west of Ireland in the month of January to fish off Drumprana, Drum that's in the northwest of Ireland. The boats used to go there in the fishing season in the winter time. Life was a bit different then, besides now. I went cooking at 14 for 10 men. Your job was to cook for the men and to kyle the messenger rope, which consisted of a four-inch tarred rope that drew in the nets. You can, the heron nets, and you had to coil that every morning. And sometimes if you got heron, you were six hours in the job, or eight hours, or even twelve hours, depending on the amount of heron that was hauling. If you wasn't getting any heron, you would haul in maybe four hours. But you was up on echt every night, and you took an hour when you could get it, an hour sleep just when you could get it. So that was the life when I first started, that was in the drifters, steam drifters. That was a different story in those days, because the women were involved the same as the men. The women had to mend the nets when we came home. The house was all constructed with lofts upstairs. That's why they've got that outside stair. The nets were carried upstairs, and the women used to mend the nets. And then when the men came home and the period they repaired in the boats, they repaired the nets. It was constant work all the time, ashore and afloat, you can. That's how things went in that days. And then came the war, and we were taken into the service. We was all in the Navy, you see. And after the war, things changed dramatically. They went in for more motor boats, and the motor boats got bigger, and the fishing now is a very commercialised industry. The fishing, they had to go further afield for the fish, you see. They fished them up in shore, and they had to go further afield now. They got bigger boats, and they've gone in for pair trawling, and all that different modes of fishing, like purse netting. The draft net fishing went out after the war. Well, it was just in the in the year, winter, it was just in the year, the winter after the war, that the boats were working the winter fishing. And the winter fishing was just finished, and they were coming home. My father was in the Drifter Exchequer, which was built in Bucky and launched from Smith's Yard in Bucky. The day before the Loyal went ashore, there was a northeast gale for about two or three days, and there was a heavy swell coming in. But the wind was doon. My mother was expecting my father home that night. I was to stay up with her when she was sitting waiting for him to come home. My father came in and he said there was a heavy sea coming in and the lacht was out in the lacht house. And they struck the pint of the key and they knocked it out their stem and they 
command stern thrust into Bucky. Halfway across, they passed a sailboat coming across for half sail. At that time, I used to sit and listen to the yarn again, and I was just going to wait in my bed when the rockets went up for the lifeboat. My father pulled on his sheen and he rushed away out, pulling on his jacket. He said, that must be the sailboat we passed. It must have gone the wrong side of the harbour. So he went away out and my mother put on her shawl and I went away down to the end of the street. I was just doing for the harbour. There was a boatie there. We went to the, into the back of the boatie and looked out and we could see the last of the boat at the back of the harbour. There was a rowing boat in Bucky at the time and the coxswain of the lifeboat was John Murrah. He came for the yardie but the lifeboat couldn't get over to the boat for the rocks. They were trying to get a line across the boat from the quay, but the weather was coming over, you can. One man, Andrew May, he belonged to Portese. He tried to swim up with a rope to the boat, but the sea was too heavy, and he was pulled back. The hail of the crew perished, and the men ashore could do nothing about it. And the last man that was left in the boat, he was the skipper. He tied himself to the mast. The mast went about four o'clock in the morning. Peter Thompson was the skipper. They were working at the end of the harbour that time, extending the pier. The pier of the harbour used to come flush, flush with the lactose, and they were extending it, rest out, about 350 yards or so further out. The diver was working next morning at the end of the pier. The diver's name was Phillips. They stayed doing at the end of Ianston there, next to the harbour. There were three harbour houses there, the divers and the harbour employees. He was doing work at the end of the pier from the skipper come round the pier, same as though he was walking, and put his two arms round the driver's thing mart. Phillips turned his thing mart to be pulled up, and they pulled him up, the skipper had his arms around the diver's neck. The diver Philip never dived again after that. They got the crew, one after the other, in different parts of the beaches. Remember that was way back in either 1919 or 1920. Aye, 1920 it was. Well, the summer fishing started on the 10th of May, and the boats, some of the boats, went to the west coast to fish Stornoway. But the majority of the boats went to Shetland, to Lerick, to fish there. They fished in all directions for Lerick, Bressy, Shapsaw, north of the Bard, north of the Scourt Point, and all around the Shetland Isles. There were hundreds of women went for the coast here, down to Shetland, to gut the here and during the season. They were transported there by steamers that came to the ports. Sometimes they came to Bucky and picked up the women and took their trunks and took them down to Shetland. Some went doing in boats that was carrying barrels, the barrel boats. Of course, the coopers made the barrels at Haymar winter, and they transported them down to Shetland before the season started. The women stayed in the huts, three to a crew, a packer and two gutters, and they made their living that way. They got so much the barrel, I think. I don't know how much it was at the time. Maybe it depended on the different curer. They work it there for the season, and then... The season started up further south and the boats moved down to Strongy waters. There was a certain amount of women there and some of them were transferred from Shetland to Strongy. And then as the fishing progressed they moved down to the Wick waters. They fished off Wick and Fraserburgh and Peterhead and the women moved all on the coast, got in the heron. And then in the latter part of the season they moved down to Shields and Blythe and they fished from there down as far as Scarborough. At the end of the season, the boats came home, they fit, refitted, and they went away down to Yarmouth. The Yarmouth fishing started in October, about the 5th or 6th. They fished there in Yarmouth and Lowestoft, waters working from the Havenborough waters right down to Smith's Knoll. Light shipping round about 20 or 30 miles from the Knoll on the Breton banks. And all around there they fished for the heron. The season lasted until the end of December. Some boats went down the channel to fish, but the majority came home and prepared for the winter fishing, which took them round to the west coast, round Stornoway and the South Minch. 
If there was log fishing, in which they work at the logs anchor in their nets, at start, that started in the month of December. When outside fishing started in the month of January, then the boats went right to the outside of the minches, and that carried on to the month of April, sometimes maybe before that, maybe the month of March. The boats came home and repaired their sails and their nets for the heron season again, which started in the month of May, aye, round about the 10th of May. The first drifter that my father had that I went to see, it was a Summerton BCK126. We had that, and I went in her from when I was 14, up until the war started in 1939. Then I went away to the services. When we came home, I fished in the Summerton, and a cousin took her over, and we balked the forelock, BCK127. We fished up until the forelock was put away. Motor boats came into being, because the drifters were not a paying prospect. They were too dear to run, and the boats were condemned and put to scrap. <laughs>